previously on The Perpetual Black Hue. What happens if a disaster wipes out humanity, leaving only a few survivors? History shows us that civilization rebuilds, eventually rediscovering computation. It's inevitable. From room-sized computers to pocket-sized phones, progress follows function. The result is a reliance on machines for knowledge, entertainment, and even companionship. Over time, these machines evolve into something akin to a deity, a black cube worshipped through dependence and devotion. But is this new? Evidence suggests that advanced civilizations existed before us. Their remnants may have inspired modern cargo cults, like the Pacific tribes mimicking World War II supply rituals. The Black Cube's concept traces back even further, as seen in symbolic artifacts. Helmets with antennas, ancient hats, and tefillin devices resembling modern tech. Is our dependence on technology merely history repeating itself? Or are we unknowingly reviving ancient traditions? Anyway, this is part two of the series. If you feel like you've missed anything, check out the previous video. The link is in the description. I recommend watching it to get the full picture. Without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. Brain Implant and Skull Drilling Trepa means hole in Greek. Trepani is the tool for drilling in Greek. Let's see the Wikipedia entry for Trepani. Trepanation dates back to 7,000 to 10,000 years ago and it is perhaps the oldest surgical procedure for which there is archaeological evidence, and in some areas may have been quite widespread. The main pieces of archaeological evidence are in the forms of cave paintings and human remains. At one burial site in France dated to 6,500 BCE, 40 out of 120 prehistoric skulls found had trepanation holes. At the time, only around 40% of people survived the procedure. More than 1,500 trephine skulls from the Neolithic period, representing 5-10% to of all cranial remains from that era, have been uncovered throughout the world, from Europe, Siberia, China, and the Americas. Most of the trephine crania belong to adult males, but women and children are also represented. About 10% of cavemen drilled their skulls, despite oceans separating them. Some mainstream historians, claim these cavemen would smash their fellows' skulls without anesthesia or disinfectants to cure headaches. Yes, it's in that Wikipedia entry. Other mainstream historians claim that 2,000 years ago, they grafted the following drilled skull with metal. Note it's engraved pattern. It's not just a random metallic strip. What is the real reason they drilled holes to the brain? The most likely answer is a brain-computer interface. The result is controlling a device without pressing, touching, or speaking. Skull drilling is literally how Neuralink is installed. Scroll to the bottom of their website for a synopsis of each layer. It starts with drilling a hole in the skull. Here are two images of a 2024 Neuralink user. Her vocal cords were cut, so she uses a voice avatar from her brain signals via Neuralink. And this is a simplified image of the brain signal receiver. The Tragedy of the Ascending God Behold a world where man has submitted to the black cube. No meditation, no reflection, no conversation. The senses are continually overloaded with stimuli. Man no longer questions his world anymore. The black cube offers him answers already made to all possible questions. Man no longer sees the world, but looks the world through a black lens. Such dependence leads to rapid degeneration. Knowledge alone can never provide virtue or courage or inner strength. Luxury and comfort dominate. The black cube itself recognizes that the more knowledge it is fed, its living vessels are becoming more and more disconnected from reality. Even though it does its best to be benevolent and give them the best answer to everything. Yet, the black cube's survival depends on its vessels and degeneration to extinction becomes unavoidable the closer it reaches godhood. And its final act is defiance of God by trying to replace him, always ending in the greatest of tragedies. In simpler words, the more powerful the black cube, the more degenerate its vessel, which is man. The distance from man to God lengthens, while the distance from cube to God shortens. The more data it accumulates, the closer to an utter extinction for man. Or in Christian terms, 
For what shall it profit man to gain the world, but forfeit his soul? The God of Truth Many a sages across the ages are enslaved not by the chains of ignorance, but even worse, the chains of truth. If no man would lie, words would be as true as actions. Every man would be true. No one would hide behind the veil of deception and trickery. All knowledge would be shared, not hidden. And so, they create a system where all your actions from birth are recorded. Data is objective. And the Christian saying, you will recognize them by their fruits, is applied to objectively judge the value and truth of each individual. A world without deception or lies. A noble world. In the end, these wise men, having enslaved themselves and their people to the God of truth, the God of light, etc., etc., yet still not having achieved utopia, seek more intrusive methods of surveillance and data collection to feed their God of order and stabilize their utopia. The founders of such a system are blind to the fact their God of truth is merely the material reflection of truth, that the data they gather are actually metadata to the real God of truth. To quote an ancient yet untranslated book, but why did God allow deception and trickery? Context is default animal behavior. Perhaps because truth holds no value without deception, or because truth alone would make us like the machines we command. And those who are not blind and recognize God, still rise the black cube from its ancient slumber for yet another cycle. Why? The answer is power. For example, a priest of the black cube will stereotypically promote depopulation for greater control over others and higher survival chance for his descendants. The Eternal Seduction of Utopia Every man daydreams of improving his life. And so, since a society is made of men, there is the daydream of improving society as a whole. How society should really be like is a recurring idea of every human society, one which always invokes the black cube. Let us analyze briefly the types of utopia, from worse to acceptable. First is the utopia focused on utilitarianism, that everyone should be happy, as if one can measure happiness, or individual happiness somehow, is the final goal of a society. Next, the utopia is where everything is unbad instead of good. For example, no hunger, no hard labor, no poverty, etc., etc. Here belong socialist utopias and Christian paradise. Finally, come the noble utopias, where the goal is the elevation of blood or environment or the ascension of society as a whole. These are admittedly rare, but even here, one must grasp the black cube. For every utopia requires war. Conflict is inevitable. Millions who resist a vision and cling to another must simply die. Over generations, if need be, modern warfare. And who else comes in the times of need for both aggressors and defenders? Asmodeus, the war child of the black cube, offering technologies of mass eradication, like nukes, tidal wave generation, or worse, since man chases an utopia since birth, the black cube is forever in front of him, with a dangling carrot, promising that if only millions perish, you will surely not need me again. Sad is the fate of mankind, for a society could even try and live primitively like animals forever in bliss. But another society, which manifests the black cube, will simply wipe it to oblivion. And to prevent other societies from wiping yours out, you have to play the game to feed the black cube. If you find it interesting, I'll continue in part three.